Good evening and welcome again to Wednesdays in the Word, the weekly online study of the Bible hosted by Lebanon Rock Church. I'm Pastor Matt Skiles. Welcome to our study for this Wednesday, June the 22nd, 2022. We are starting uh, our lesson tonight, continuing our current lesson series from the book of 1 Corinthians. We will be in lesson number nine tonight and uh, focusing on 1 Corinthians chapter 11 with the title and theme of this lesson being Be Wise About Church Order. I do want to say in the coming weeks, we will be talking extensively on the gifts of the Spirit uh, and, and describing those in, in clear detail. So you don't want to miss the next several weeks that are upcoming as we'll be talking about the gifts of the Spirit and, uh, and really how they are utilized in the worship service and in the body of Christ. So I just want to give a little preview of what's coming up. But as always, you want to make sure you have your Bible with you. you want to make sure that you have your tablet, your smartphone, whatever your Bible app is that you're using. Have that ready tonight as we begin to prepare to go through the Word of God. And also, if you brought something to drink, Pastor Matt has his cup of coffee. Um, in one of my favorite coffee mugs. I have several, but that's one of my favorites. It is baseball season, so let's read for the St. Louis Cardinals. But uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to get right into the lesson tonight. So join with me as we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity that we have to once again study this wonderful, wonderful lesson in this wonderful book of 1 Corinthians. We pray that you will just uh, give our hearts and our minds an open understanding, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. And Father, we pray that you'll bless everything that is said and done. And Lord, we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So bless this study, we pray, and be with us, O Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Okay, if you have your Bibles, go with me, if you would, please, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Now, we've been talking a lot about Paul's letter here to the Corinthians, and he had some negative things to say um, to the church later in this particular section of the letter. And, uh, and of course, he opens on a positive note, and he's praising the church. And then, you know, there's two matters in particular that we talked about um, that... Um, you know, that he, he points out and is very praiseworthy in his statements when he talks about, um, you know, the church remembered Paul and they appreciated him and the church was faithful to keep the teachings that had been given to them. Um, but, you know, there were also things that were happening in the church that Paul was dealing with. And one of the biggest problems that Paul was dealing with at this particular time in the letter and that he addresses is disorder in the church at Corinth, uh, especially in the public meetings. And, um, you know, there were men and women that were assuming a lot more freedom, probably, uh, than, than should have been given. And uh, there was disorder in regards to the Lord's Supper. There was, there was disorder in regards to the men and women ministering within the church. There was confusion also on the use of spiritual gifts, and we'll talk a little more about that, as I said, in the coming weeks. Uh, the church had been greatly enriched with spiritual gifts. This was a very spiritual church, but with that, with that depth of spirituality also came a whole lot of freedom and a little bit of a lackadaisical attitude as far as the order goes. Um, you know, as a pastor of a Pentecostal full gospel church, I truly believe, as many of the people in our congregation do, believe that the Holy Spirit should have the liberty and the freedom to minister and and move within the services, whether that is through the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, whether that is, uh, you know, ministering to people during times of worship or prayer. Uh, and the early church was, was very much empowered and really was led by the Holy Spirit. Church of 2022 should be doing the same thing. Unfortunately, we're not. But sometimes churches that are spiritual, that have a great spiritual depth to them, sometimes things can get a little chaotic and a little out of hand, and there's disorder. That's no different today than it was, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago when the Apostle Paul was trying to 
you know, establish order in the church. He wasn't quenching the spirit. He wasn't trying to stifle the move of God, but he wanted the Corinthian church to know that there is a pattern, there is an order, and there is a God-ordained way of worshiping that pleases God. And so that's what we're going to focus on here because Paul wanted the Corinthian church to be very wise and have an understanding about church order. There's a certain way that things are done. Now, some modern day denominations and some modern day church organizations take that to mean that the Holy Spirit should not move in the service, that you cannot let God minister to people, whether it's in worship, whether it is people uh, coming up for special prayer or praying for people or uh, the gifts of the Spirit in operation. Just this past Sunday, um, our church uh, experienced uh, a time of worship where the Holy Spirit ministered and people began to enter in. That's normal. That should be the normal practice of churches in the New Testament. Uh, and that's what God desires. And Paul wanted the same thing. But Paul dealt with three particular areas of confusion that was taking place in the public worship there in the church of the Corinthians. So the first point we want to look at here is is Paul is dealing with the first area was women praying and prophesying. And this is a sore spot for a lot of people. Uh, so let's just go. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Go with me. Pastor Matt has his Bible as well. So I'll give you a moment to find that. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And we're going to be reading verses 3 all the way down to verse number 16. And notice again, what the Apostle Paul says here. And I like uh, the scripture and I like the teaching here that the Apostle Paul talks about. Now, now to preface this, I want to say that, that there was a lot of freedom um, in the early church, but the Christian church at that time, and, the, and really, the, really the New Testament church and the message of grace and salvation gave a lot of freedom and really a lot of hope. Uh, to women, children, and even to servants and slaves. It taught that all people, regardless of race, gender, were equal before God. God is no respecter of persons. And that all believers were one in Jesus Christ. That's what Galatians uh, 3 and 28 tells us. Um, and as we've noticed before, the churches were perhaps the only fellowship in the Roman Empire that welcomed all people regardless of their nationality, social status, gender, or economic position. And, you know, it was to be expected that there would be some who would carry that freedom uh, to some excess. Um, a new movement always suffers uh, more from its disciples than from its enemies, unfortunately. And... This was true in Corinth. This was a church that was very powerful and spiritual, that was faithful to the word of God, that held on to the, the, the teachings of the gospel. They had heard the preaching of Paul. They had been saved, converted, baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. They had experienced the, uh, the gifts of the Spirit. They had seen the miracle working power of God, and that gave them great hope and gave them great freedom. So when they came into worship, everybody was on the same level playing field, so to speak. And some of the women that were not used to that social status began to uh, take advantage of that in a way probably that um, that probably would not would not necessarily be a problem today, but it was a problem back then. This is 2022. Um, and we have, you know, especially in the Church of North America, whether it's Canada, the United States, or even Mexico, you have men and women that operate in the gift of ministry, that operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And many of the women that were in uh, that were in the church at that time were operating with great, great, great liberty. Uh, they were prophesying. They were praying. They were probably uh, engaging in the services in a very demonstrative way. And, and the Apostle Paul was not telling them not to worship God. He wasn't telling them to stop worshiping God. But he was telling them that what they were doing was disrupting the service. 
Uh, I'll give you a prime example of what I'm talking about. I was an evangelist for three years, and uh, I traveled all over the United States. And there was more than one occasion where I would go to churches, whether they were small churches or they were average-sized churches or even big churches. Um, and I got to meet all kinds of, of different people. I got to minister to all different kinds of church fellowships and congregations. Um, and it was a blessing and a privilege to do that. And it was a wonderful time in my life, um, and I enjoyed it. But there were there were occasions where I would go to churches, and uh, during the services that were taking place, uh, more than likely there would be a disruption in the service, or someone would 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 all of a sudden begin to do something that was very demonstrative. Prime example was I was doing a revival in the state of Michigan. I was at a church. I will not mention the name of the church or the city, but I was at a church, and during praise and worship, everything was going well. The church was entering into worship. People were praising God. People were worshiping God. And then a couple from out of state that was there, they came uh, to the platform to sing a song. And in the process of singing the song that they were singing, they basically, for lack of a better way of saying it, tried to take over the service. And um, they they uh, were doing that. And, uh, and it was very much uh, out of order. It was very much not in the flow of the spirit. And so once they got done singing and sat down, I took the microphone and quickly got the service back in the direction it needed to go. Um, that happens more often than not. Unfortunately, with a great spiritual freedom and liberty in churches, you're going to have uh, you're going to have chances and opportunities for uh, things to get a little sideways and chaotic. I don't particularly like that. I like things being done decently and in order. And uh, I've always wanted it to be that way. But in this case, Paul was dealing and addressing this. Uh, some of the women were talking during the service. They were speaking during the service. While the preaching was going on, that was not acceptable or tolerated. Um, they, they, they were not worshiping and entering in as they should. So um, Paul gives basically... Uh, you know, three fundamental, uh, you know, foundations or three fundamentals of, of how women were, you know, to, to not only uh, interact in the congregation, but how men and women were to do that. And so the reason why, um, you know, you know, God wanted order in the church and God wants things done decently and in order Paul gives three reasons here in this first point. The first one was redemption. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, and let's look at verses 3 through 7. Paul says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head, uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For he that is even all one, as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, lest her be covered. For a, for a man indeed, ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now, a lot of people take this to be very sexist and very chauvinistic, um, but there, there was a, a, an order to God's uh, will within the church. There is a definite order of headship to the church. The Father is the head over Christ, Christ is the head over the man. The man is the head over the woman. Some interpret head to mean origin. But that would mean that the father originated Christ, something we cannot accept. Um, because in his redemptive ministry, as son of God and as the Messiah, Christ was subject to the father, even though he was equal to the father. Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-existent. 
But Paul was writing here, speaking here to the fact that women were coming into the church with their heads uncovered. Now, you have to realize the cultural day, the cultural norms of the day. The only women that walked around in society with their heads uncovered were prostitutes, were harlots. And um, when their heads weren't covered, that was a sign of shame. And of course, you know, uh, also, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, the women that were appearing there in the sanctuary without their heads covered were actually, you know, putting themselves on the low level uh, of society with temple prostitutes and with harlots and women of the night. Paul was saying that that there should be there should be a, a a sense of holiness and godliness, and that women should 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 cover themselves. Men should not cover themselves, but women should. And of course, you know, Paul also was making a very 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 strong statement here that men and women are both made in the image of God. Um, and 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 that when a husband and wife were in the in the worship service together. The husband is uncovered. The wife was covered. That was just a sign of moderation, dignity, holiness. That was a cultural thing at the time. Also, too, uh, it, it also evokes God's structure and God's order for the family and for the church. Uh, anytime a father or a man is the spiritual leader of his home, he's going to lead his family as an example of godliness, righteousness, faith and holiness. And at this particular time, Paul was stating to the Corinthians, let things be done in moderation. Let your, you know, let your, let your righteousness and let your life be an example. Um, you know, there, there needed to be a difference between men and women here. And so that's what uh, the Lord was trying to uh, convey through Paul's writing here. You know, um, you know, Paul was saying, don't abandon the covering. You know, let the woman cover herself. You know, when I, speaking there of the beauty of a woman's hair and, and the beauty of a woman's covering. And, uh, you know, there should always be, Paul makes it very clear, there should always be a distinction between a man and a woman. Um, there should be distinct features that uh, tell you that a man is different from a woman. We live in a culture today where, where those gender lines are blurred. And uh, I may offend some people by saying this, but there's only two genders, okay? This binary trans stuff is, 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 just, is just a lie from the pit of hell. Um, you know, if you are biologically and anatomically born a, a male, or if you are biologically and anatomically born a female, that is who you are and what you are. Uh, you know, I, I, I've known since I was a child that I was a boy, that I was a male, that I preferred... Uh, I preferred uh, girls. I, I, you know, I had all the male hormones and tendencies that a little boy has. And now I'm a 51-year-old man, and I still uh, have those same tendencies. Um, there's a lot of gender confusion today, and part of, the, part of that is due to the breakdown of the family and the breakdown of, of Judeo-Christian values as well. But that being said, Paul says that when it comes to, you know, women praying and prophesying in the church. There has to be order because of redemption. Another foundation he gives is creation. Go back, if you would, to verse number 8. Let's read verses 8 through 12. And I like what Paul says here. Paul says in the scriptures these words. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's find verse number 8. Paul says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head, power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman but all things of God. So we've already touched briefly on this truth. God's order is based on the fact that man was created first, and then the woman was created for the man. And, uh, and that's how God has established the family and the God-given roles of men and women. And 
you know, priority does not imply inferiority there. Let me say that again. Paul made it clear uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 11 and 12, that there is a partnership as well uh, as a headship uh, in God's creation. The man and the woman are spiritually one in the Lord. And, and one cannot do without the other. So it is a partnership. It is a, a oneness. They are mutually submitting each to the other. And so that's the, uh, the wonderful beauty of, of marriage and male-female relationships. Furthermore, you know, uh, it's ironic, but it's true. While the woman may have come from the rib of the man and may have come from a man at the beginning, today, now man is born of the woman. Uh, so so man, men and women belong to each other and need each other. And so, you know, Paul brings up the angels here in 1 Corinthians 11 and 10, but he was arguing from the facts of creation. And the angels were part of the creation. The angels also know their place and show respect when they worship God for they cover their faces. So, you know, in a lot of ways, Paul is saying women and men understand the order of things, and there is an order to God's kingdom. There is an order to the church, and we are to practice that. So Paul was saying, while I, while I do not, um, while I do not, um, you know, uh, feel that, 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 brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, you know, I, you know, can enter. I do not feel like it's, it's a sin for brothers and sisters in Christ to enter into worship together. He's saying that we need to be careful how we worship and be careful in the way that we worship. And the reason also too, is the third foundational statement that Paul gives is also nature. So he, he, he bases it on redemption, creation, and nature. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. Paul says, judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman prays unto God uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her? For her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. So in a general way, it is true that nature gives women longer hair and men shorter hair. And the Romans and the Greeks and the Jews, uh, you know, pretty much followed that custom. Uh, Nowhere does the Bible tell us how long a person's hair should be, um, men's hair and women's hair, so that there's, you know, it should be in a way that there's no confusion. Um, and, you know, some people have very short hair, some people have very long hair, but, you know, really the, 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 the beauty of, 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 of women is seen in their feminine beauty and their long hair and their, and their femininity. And so, Paul is saying that they're covering their hair is one of the beauty marks of who they are as women. So that should be something that should be celebrated and should be admired. And they use their hair as almost like a covering. And, and Paul is saying that, that it's a sin for a man to look and try to take on the, the look of a woman, just like it is for a woman to take on the, the form of a man. It goes against nature. And we're seeing a lot of that in our culture today. Uh, in the sense that, that the church is becoming a place of disorder. Now we have churches that, you know, um, that, that affirm and support not only, you know, people that are, that are of a different sexual orientation, that are gay or that are lesbian or that are transgender or, or binary or, or whatever other term you want to use. Um, you know, I call it the alphabet nonsense because people use all these different things, you know, I'm binary, I'm this, I'm that, you know, you're either, you're either male or female. That's how God created us. And that's how Jesus has called it. And the Lord does not dispense or he does not mince words. When he says, have you not read 
he that made them at the beginning made them male and female. I don't know whatever part of that people don't understand. But, you know, I, I until the day I die, that's how I'm going to believe and hold to that truth because it's in the word of God. If you have a problem with that and you say, well, I'm offended, Pastor Skiles, that you would say that, take it up with God. Take it up with God. He wrote it in the word of God. This book right here is the word of God. It is the word of truth. Okay. And someday we're all going to be judged by this word, whether you like it or not. And so if you hold to that mindset and you think that can be welcomed into the church, Paul is saying no. And I'm echoing what Paul says. Paul was dealing with a cultural situation involving men and women in the church and saying this has to be done orderly. Men and women have their God-given roles in the church. They have their place in the church. And men and women can, can, can minister in the church and can, be, uh, and can have an opportunity to serve in the church. But it is important to remember that God has an order and God has a structure. And when we get outside of that order, that's when we run into problems. God is not the author of confusion. And so when God says that he has an order and a purpose and a plan, we need to follow it. Okay. So let's go on to our second point. And Paul was dealing with the second area of order, and that was the selfishness at the so-called love feast. So let's go to... 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's look at verses 17 through verse number 22. It says, Now, in this that I declare unto you, Paul goes, I praise, I praise you, not that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Well, first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, in, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Now, since the beginning of the church, it was customary for the believers to eat together. They did that in Acts 2 and 42 and Acts 2 and 46 broke their bread, ate their bread with gladness, and had all things common. And it was an opportunity for fellowship and, and for sharing. Um, and, and, you know, and no doubt that those gatherings and those meals were obviously culminated with observing the Lord's Supper. And, and they called this meal the Love Fest, uh, since it was emphasizing the showing of love for the saints of God sharing with one another, uh, and the agape feast, that's from the Greek word of love, was part of the worship of the Corinthians. They would have a love, uh, an agape feast, where they would eat and share, and then they would take the Lord's Supper. Uh, but what happened was, you know, uh, these agape feasts were doing more harm than good, because it, you know, people would break out into their own separate cliques and groups, and uh, there wasn't a lot of fellowship. There's a lot more division there, and ultimately it caused problems, and people were being very, very selfish. You know, the rich, upper-class people would bring, you know, food for themselves, but yet poor people didn't have, uh, have food and didn't have a chance to share and partake because you would have people from all different social economic levels, people from all different social economic backgrounds ethnic backgrounds, you had some people that were poor, people that were wealthy, people that were well-to-do. And so when they would come together for these agape fests or these love feasts, and they would begin to, to eat their food, they would just sit together in their own little group, and they, they weren't coming together. There wasn't a unity. The Bible talks about endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. One of the ways that you, that you build unity and fellowship in a church uh, is by coming together and sharing with one another. You know, one of the great strengths of any church is in its fellowship. 
and people get together, people share. Um, you know, when we do, when you know, we have some wonderful times. We do Fifth Sunday Social Fellowships. We have fellowship dinners. We're having, uh, we have a church in the park every summer, uh, and people come together and share. It's a great time, and you know what? We don't play favorites. Everyone is welcome. So when we have a big social gathering and there's a lot of food and everybody is fellowshipping together, if somebody didn't bring some food, that's fine. Everybody is welcome to partake and to share uh, and to be a part of what we're doing. And the Corinthians didn't understand that. There was cliques and there was division. And Paul was saying there, you can't be selfish. You know, the, the true sign of Christian love is seen in being selfless and not being selfish. I think it's sad sometimes that the church, uh, while we're called to love our neighbor as ourself, sometimes can be some of the most selfish people you want to meet. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I think churches have to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And we need to be good stewards with the resources and the uh, material blessings that God gives us. You know, I just this past week, I received two phone calls from people wanting help, needing help with utility bills, needing help with rent. Um, people need help and assistance. And I understand times are difficult and these are, these are very difficult economic times for some people. But, you know, some people just want to take advantage of the decency and the goodness of a church. So we have to be wise about that. I'm not implying that, that, that the church just give away everything. We have to be very, very careful and wise and mindful of who we help and how we help. But when it comes to fellowship, like the Corinthian church, there was division there because people did not make other people feel welcome. Whether it was, uh, whether it was Christians that were in the church that were wealthy and well-to-do that had plenty of food, that had a feast, and then you have poor people that gave nothing and they weren't sharing with them, there's not a whole lot of love there. There's not a whole lot of fellowship there. So everyone came together and, 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 and Paul's saying, you have to be sure that if there's something that can, that can be a blessing to someone, then, then you, you bless them in return. A great example of this, uh, if I can remember, was uh, we had a, uh, we've always had a big Thanksgiving dinner at our church every year. Every year we've had a Thanksgiving dinner at our church. We serve about seven to 800 Thanksgiving meals a lot of people help, a lot of volunteers. It's an annual tradition. And we've been doing this for the last 38 years. And it's not uncommon at the end of our Thanksgiving dinner, we've had many people from the community come out. We have fed a lot of people. We've served all these Thanksgiving dinners. It's not uncommon for us uh, whenever we have, in times past, when we've had extra food, where we have boxed up that food, we have put together the turkey, the mashed potatoes, the green beans, the corn, and we have made, uh, you know, we have taken care packages to halfway house, to the women's shelter, to the police stations, um, to the fire, fire stations, firehouses. Uh, we have taken food to, uh, you know, to the jail. Uh, we have tried to feed everybody. We have not just tried to take care of our own. That's the true sign of, of what a church should be like. You know, um, I know that there have been times during our VBS when we have had food for our children. We've had 35, 40, 50 kids, and we're feeding them hot dogs and potato chips and, and things to drink, you know, fruit punch or lemonade. And we've had parents come in. And uh, they've had teenage kids that were too old for VBS, or they had little babies that were too young that weren't, didn't fall in that four to 12 range. And we would tell those parents, please sit down. Would your kids like something to eat? Uh, and we feed them, uh, whether it's teenagers or whether it's their little, their, their little toddlers. The reason we do that is because that's what the church is called to do. Paul say, don't be selfish in these love fests, in these agape fests, in these fellowships. And the third area that Paul talks about as we, as we move to our third and final point, as Paul also talks about abuses of the Lord's Supper. So let's look here because in verse 23 through 34, Paul was talking about the importance of the Lord's Supper and how there was abuse being done during the Lord's Supper. 
Paul gives the best example of how Christians in the church are to conduct themselves and how we are to administer, share, partake, and conduct ourselves with receiving the bread and cup of the Lord's table and partaking of communion. Uh, and it's something very, very important. And, and so, you know, there was some abuses going on there. And Paul, Paul marks down uh, um, about how the Corinthians had, had abused that. And in 1 Corinthians 11 and 30, Paul says, For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep or have died. So Paul gives us some instructions here on what we must do if the Lord's Supper is to bring blessing and not chastening and judgment. Okay, Communion is not something that is done out of, out of ritual. It's not done just to, it's not done just to fill a date on your church schedule or calendar. It is a solemn, important time. And so the first thing Paul says to the Corinthians is when you partake of the Lord's Supper and the Lord's table, we should look back. So verse number 23 through verse number 26 of the book of 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you Eat this bread and drink this cup. You do show the Lord's death until he comes. The broken bread, of course, reminds us of Christ's body given for us. And the cup reminds us of his shed blood. It is a remarkable thing that Jesus Christ wants us, his followers, to remember his death. Most people try to forget that. And most people try to, you know, Forget about his death. But Christians are called to remember that because we show his death until he returns. And, and you know, it's important because he gave his body to be, to, be, to be sacrificed. He gave his blood to cleanse us from sin. Secondly, Paul says we should look ahead because in verse number 26 of 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. So we remember the sacrifice, and it should be a solemn remembrance. It should be something that we do not take lightly, okay? And we should remember that, but also, too, Paul says, by doing this, you are showing the Lord's death until he returns. You are showing the world that you testify to the death of, the resurrection, and the second coming of Jesus Christ by partaking of that bread, drinking of that cup. Jesus gave his body. He gave his blood. He made the sacrifice for our sins. So we are remembering that. So Paul says we have to look back, reminding ourselves of what Jesus did. And then we need to look ahead. We need to look ahead because Jesus is coming back. And so we know that because of that blood and because of that body, that he gave on the cross, we have the eternal hope of glory, and we know Christ is coming for us. And also, thirdly, Paul says we should look within. And this is the part of communion I think a lot of people misunderstand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 through 32, Paul says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh judgment or damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, 
that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, Paul did not say that we had to be worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper, but only we should partake in a worthy manner. If we are to participate in a worthy manner, we must examine our own hearts, judge our sins, confess them openly to the Lord, and repent to the Lord, and then come to the Lord's table with clean hands and pure hearts. If we come to the Lord's table with unconfessed sin in our lives, we're guilty of Christ's body and blood. And 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 because of that, we bring judgment upon ourselves. That's why Paul says, you notice, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. We have to do that own self-examination or our own self-judgment. We need to judge ourselves. You know, it's important to remember that when you examine yourselves, you are, you are letting the Holy Spirit search your heart. You are letting the Holy Spirit examine your life. And if there's sin in your life, that's when you confess it, you repent of that sin, and you ask God's forgiveness. Every time we take communion at Lebanon Rock Church, we give our congregation a time for self-examination. We tell people that they can come to the altar at the front of the sanctuary and kneel and pray, or they can make an altar right where they're seated. But they need to spend that time in prayer and meditation and ask God to reveal to them their heart's condition, their life, if there's sin, if they've said anything, if they've done anything, if they've committed a sin, if they've committed evil, if they've done wrong, they need to confess it and repent of that sin and let the blood of Jesus Christ wash that sin away. We always stand on the promises. Uh, you know, the psalmist said, search me, O Lord. <laughs> know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked in me and lead me in the pathway of righteousness everlasting. And then in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So confession is not only good for our soul, but it is important when it comes to uh, receiving and preparing to receive the bread and the cup of communion. Some people come forward, they've never prayed, they've never confessed their sin, they've never asked God's forgiveness, they take the bread, they take the cup, and they, and they desecrate. And, 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 they, and they make a mockery of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, it's important to understand that, that, you you know, that we think, well, I'm not worthy to receive the bread of the cup. We have to take it in a worthy manner. That's why we confess our sins. We repent of our sins. We ask God's forgiveness. We ask God to forgive us. Then we prepare to receive, um, you know, then we prepare to receive the bread of the cup of communion. And I want to say this, too, that self-examination is between that individual and God. Paul was saying, you have to do your own self-examination. I can't do it for you. And I love what the Apostle Paul says there because he is saying, in a sense, that that's between you and God, okay? And it's not a spiritual autopsy, okay? You're just examining your heart and your life. So many people beat themselves down and feel so guilty. They don't partake of the bread and cup of communion. I'm not, I'm not worthy, Pastor Skiles. I have people now in my own church that will sit down and will not partake of the bread and cup of communion because they're ashamed. And, and that's not the case. If you are saved and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, you know, you are, are more than capable of receiving the bread and cup of communion, but it must come after a time of spiritual examination. So don't let the enemy tell you that you're not worthy because you are. You receive the bread and cup of communion in a worthy manner. So we see here in conclusion how Paul really dealt with the, the, the order of things within the church, dealing with women praying and prophesying, and of course the uh, abuse and the selfishness of the, of the love and the agape fests, and of course uh, also uh, dealing with the importance of being orderly and conducting ourselves righteously. Um, during the Lord's Supper. 
Now, next week, we're going to move into a really in-depth study of the gifts of the Spirit. So you don't want to miss that. We'll probably stay on chapters 12 and 13 for the next several weeks, focusing on the nine gifts of the Spirit. So you don't want to miss that. We're not going to rush through them, kick them off. We are going to, you know, take our time and methodically go through each and every uh, scripture and look at these gifts because they are important and they are they are. Not only, uh, not only are they important for today, but they are still very much, um, still very much a part of what we're doing uh, in the church today. Okay, and so uh, we're going to close with a word of prayer. We want to thank you all for being with us today, and just remind you what's coming up in the weeks ahead as we continue with the study of the Book of First Corinthians. Join with me as we bring this study to a close tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the opportunity that we've had to study this wonderful word and to, to share uh, in this great, great lesson from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Father, we pray you'll always help us to do things decently and in order. Help us, Father, to always be mindful of where we are at in the body of Christ and what we can do as we worship together. Father, we pray for all those that are part of this online study today. Pray that you'll bless them, God. Give them a blessed remainder to their week. Watch over them and keep your hand upon them. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege to study your word. And Father, bring us back Sunday for worship, either in person or online. And Father, we pray you bring us back next Wednesday for that study as we begin a deep, deep dive into the gifts of the Spirit. So bless us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you again for being with us. And on behalf of all of us here at Lebanon Rock Church, have a wonderful evening. Have a blessed remainder to your week. And we look forward to seeing you all with us next time.